Hare Krishna. So, we will move to the third chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. And Tana, let us do a quick recap. In the second chapter, Arjuna surrenders to Krishna and asks a question. What is the right thing to do? And in response to that, Krishna first gives Atma Gyan to help him understand that at killing is not necessarily wrong people because the soul is eternal. Now, that does not necessarily mean that killing is automatically right. All that it means is that Arjuna should not reject killing as an entirely unethical activity. Now, after he has done that, then <coughs> Krishna says, okay, then how do you determine what is the right thing to do? So he says that, he first talks about winning or losing, both ways, actually you'll be the gainer. And then he says, look for a bigger result beyond winning and losing. So that's how Krishna first talks about karma and then he talks about karma yoga. And then Arjuna wants to know what are the characteristics of the person. And Krishna answers in the second chapter from 54 to 72. Now, is it okay? So after that has been done, so now the third chapter begins. It begins with a question by Arjuna. So let's look see what is Arjuna's question. Actually, let's look at Krishna's answer because a question is a little complicated. But what is he saying is that Vyami, his question is two parts. Let's look at the second verse first. Vyami Shredeva Vakkena. So Mishra is mixed. Like some, sometimes some people send a mixed message. Mixed message means that I like you but I don't like you. So, <laughs> so what is it actually? So Vyami Shredeva Vakkena. Now Arjuna is being res respectful. He is not saying your message is mixed. He said it seems mixed to be ego. Vakke na. So, Vyamishre Neva Vakke na. Vyamishre Neva Vakke na. So, because of your mixed seeming words, what has happened? Buddhi mohya seema me. Buddhi, my intelligence is mohya. It's bewildered. It's, now it's interesting. The world's temptations, they generally bewilder our mind. But spiritual instructions, <coughs> if they are ambiguous, they will bewilder, not our mind, they will bewilder our intelligence. So that's why I say buddhi mohesi, not mana mohesi. So it's my intelligence is not able to figure it out. Generally, if the mind gets bewildered, it just says, I like it and I want it, I don't care whether it is good or bad. But if the intelligence is bewildered, I can't understand this. So, buddhi, buddhi moya siva me. Buddhi moya siva me. So therefore, because I am confused, that ekam vada nishchitya. The priest tell me one thing. That ekam vada nishchitya. That ekam vada nishchitya. So, tell me one, one thing you can tell me for certain, nishchitya. But what one thing? Yena shreyo am apnuyan. By which Shreya, Shreya is long term good, can be obtained. Yena Shreya Ham Apnuya. Yena Shreya Ham Apnuya. Get together, two words. Vyam Shreya Vakena, Buddhim Moya Shiva Me, Tari Kambal Shitya, Yena Shreya Ham Apnuya. So, let's see. What are the words of Krishna that seem confusing to Arjuna? That seem ambiguous. So basically, Arjuna has started, Arjuna is thinking that I have two options among which I need to choose. The two options are fight or don't fight. And 
he putting these actions in broader context. So he says fighting is broadly the path of action. Not fight is the path of renunciation. So he is seeing these two paths and for him he associates peace with which path? Don't fight. Obviously, you think that is what will give peace to us. So, if that is what is going to give peace, then Krishna, towards the end of the last chapter, in 271 and 72, or 270 and 71, he uses the word peace. He says, Apurimaan machala pratishtam samudram apaha pravishan diyadvad tadvud kamayam pravishan di sarve sa shanti maap nauti na kamayami So Krishna is talking about shanti over there. And then again, he also talks about shanti a little later. Next verse also. Vihaya kamayya sarvan humams charati nispruha nirmamo nirahankara sa shanti madhi gachati so, Krishna in 70, 70 and 71, in the second chapter, has talked about the person who is a perfected yogi. Now, Arjuna understands this perfect. Krishna has talked about, at that time, clearly karma yogi. Hmm? He's talking about the path of action. The perfected state of that path of action is that that person will attain peace. Arjuna asks about the characteristics of that person. So he says, the characteristics is that this person attains peace. Now Arjuna is thinking, if the ultimate purpose is to attain peace, then why is Krishna telling me to fight? So fighting is the opposite of being peaceful. So therefore he says, Vyami Shrene and now the, the confusion arises because you know, both Krishna and Arjuna are talking about the same thing, peace. Uh, Krishna is talking about, the, about peace, Arjuna is also thinking about peace. But Krishna is talking about inner peace. Arjuna is thinking about outer peace. So, because they are talking about pea, two different kinds of peas, so what happens is Arjuna's intelligence is not in one piece. <laughs> <laughs> so, no. He says, okay, my intelligence is pulled in two different directions. What exactly are you talking about, Krishna? So, therefore, he says, Pada Nishchitya, please tell me one thing clearly. And now, what Krishna will do is, he will start explaining things more systematically. When the Bhagavad Gita begins from its context in the battlefield, it is not that Krishna has made a systematic plan, that I talk about Karma Yoga, then I talk about Bhakti Yoga, then I talk about Jnana Yoga, Dhyan Yoga, or different paths like that. Krishna is simply addressing Arjuna's question. And as a part of addressing that question, the discussion moves forward. So we could say using contemporary language, the Gita is not actually like a class. It is more like a podcast. You know, nowadays podcasts are becoming very common. And podcast, what is the characteristic? It's more like a free-flowing discussion. Now because it's a free-flowing discussion, doesn't mean that there is no meaningful content in it. Doesn't mean that there is uh, there is no structure that can be discerned afterwards. If you watch a long podcast on YouTube below them, that there are timestamps. You know, from here to here this topic is discussed. From here to here this topic is discussed. Sometimes YouTube itself makes those time time divisions. Sometimes the uh, those who are posted they can themselves make an input also, whichever way they want. But the point is that. Even if there is one discussion, it not, need not necessarily be that everything within that particular section is only that discussion. Because it's more of a free-flowing discussion. 
when we talk about a class, it is highly scripted. Scripted means that it is a clear, uh, like a script is written, not necessarily literally every single word, but it is scripted and well structured. So, Krishna gives a broad overview with a conclusion to Arjuna, and Arjuna needs a more systematic explanation. And that is what Krishna will start now. So, Krishna starts by, first of all, talking about the concept of Adhikar. Now, Adhikar in today's uh, language, kya Adhikar hai tumara? So, what is your right or what is your authority? Mm -hmm. So, that is the way the word is used nowadays. So, Adhikari is an authority figure. That's the word. But in the tradition, the word Adhikar has a slightly different meaning. Tradition, it refers to qualification. It's similar, but there is a slight difference over there. The focus is more on that Adhikar is generally, if somebody says Adhikar, this is what you can do. Hmm? That's a contemporary sense. But in the traditional sense, the meaning is more is this is what you are qualified to do. This is what you can understand. This is where you are at. So Krishna will now start talking about different levels at which a person may be. And based on that, he will analyze how a person should act. So broadly, Krishna will talk about the level of being attached, the level of being detached. These are the two broad levels you talk about. And now within attached and detached. Now attached and detached are these, uh, do these refer to externals or internals? Yeah, attached and detached, this term themselves refer to the internals. Mm -hmm. Now, correspondingly, we might, this is, a, it is Arjuna's conception. He is equating this with engaged and disengaged. So, he is saying that we engage means engaged in activity. So, Arjuna equates attached with engaged and detached with disengaged. So, at engaged means in action and disengaged is from action. So, Arjuna is thinking broadly speaking that if I am engaged, then why would I be engaged unless I am attached? So, although Krishna has talked about the concept of Karma Yoga, it is a bit of a complex concept. And Krishna will need to elaborate on that. So, so now, <coughs> Krishna says that this is too simplistic. There is truth to it, but this is simplistic, Krishna says. Why, why is it the simplistic? He says because the attached actually can be both engaged and disengaged. Mm -hmm. We'll explain how. And similarly, the detached can also be engaged and disengaged. So the attached may act or the attached may renounce action. The detached may act or the detached may renounce action. So, how is this possible? Le now, if this is complicated, let me make it a little more complicated. <laughs> Before, make it simpler afterwards. In general, education has these two aspects. Education means to show the complexity in the simple and the 
simplicity in the complex. Both aspects are there to education. Sometimes somebody will think this is so simple. Okay, I am sick and this is the medicine that cures the sickness. You give me this medicine. It's so simple. But if medicine were that simple, you know, all of us would just go to pharmacy and we could just take medicines. But there are other factors involved. In that what is the case history of the patient? What are the possible side effects? Is this medicine contraindicated for something? So law also, this is the this is the crime and this is the punishment. It's a bit straightforward. It's simple. And if you do wrong, you'll be punished. True. But again, context matters. And then if somebody has killed someone, or did they kill with a cold-blooded plan? Did they kill in a moment of anger? Did they kill in self-defense? These three are very different situations. At least the first and second are slightly different, but third is totally different. So what happens is, at one level, it's important to understand that things that seem simple, they may not be that simple. And this, uh, the human intelligence can go, go, go both ways. One is to make things unnecessarily complex. Uh, things are simple, keep them simple. But the, that the intelligence can go in the other direction also, make things unnecessarily simple. And in this case, Krishna is re Krishna's education is going in which direction? Right now, he is going towards showing the complexity in the simple. Now, the simplicity in the complex will be shown by Krishna in his conclusion. Sarva dharma an paritajya If all this is very complex, all that I have spoken to you till now, then just understand this conclusion. But he comes to that after an elaborate process of reasoning. And we'll see why he's doing the reasoning. Because at many, many, many reasons, but one of the key points of Krishna, you know, Krishna's method of teaching. We will be discussing this theme of how Krishna is a good teacher. So one of his Krishna's method of teaching is not centered on, it's not an authority-centered approach. Authority-centered means that I am God, you have to obey me. If that had been Krishna's approach, Krishna would have finished the whole Gita in just six words. I am God, obey me, fight. Bhagavad Gita, Sampur. So, Krishna's approach is not authority-centered approach so much as it is a wisdom-centered approach. Wisdom-centered approach means Krishna is giving reasoning to Arjuna. Krishna is appealing to Arjuna's intelligence and thereby Krishna is persuading Arjuna. The idea is that the wisdom-centered approach it equips Arjuna for decision making. The authority centered approach, what it does is, it makes the individual more dependent on the authority for the decision. If the authority is not there, what are you going to do? Now, of course, sometimes we need authority. But the overall approach of Krishna is that he wants to make Arjuna equipped for making decisions through the education that he is getting in the Gita. So for that purpose, so, so we could say that you know, go to authority, do whatever the authority is. That's a simple thing. And it is true, it's simple. But the problem is, life is not so simple. Yes, it sometimes the authority may not be available. Sometimes the authority may be available, but we may not be able to communicate our situation properly. It's like a patient, if you are sick, just do what the doctor is telling you to do. But what if the doctor is not available and you have got some issues? Uh, what if you go to a doctor but you don't, you forget to tell some of the symptoms? What if the doctor doesn't remember something from the past case history which we forget to tell? 
So what happens is, you could say following the doctor is a straightforward principle. But in real life, there's complexity. And that's why sometimes the major decisions are to be done. Quite often in the medical field, you have a second opinion. If somebody says you have to do a life-changing surgery, a, a major surgery, you mean there's a threat to life. And most people will say, okay, I'm okay to do it, but maybe let me take a second opinion also. And the second opinion is not necessarily showing a lack of trust in the doctor. It's just an acknowledgement of the gravity of the situation, the gravity of the decision. Mm -hmm. So, Krishna is taking a wisdom-centered approach. His focus is on equipping Arjuna to make the decisions. So, with that in mind, Krishna focuses on the complexity. The complexity of the, of the situation over there. So, we said that there can be, that the detached can be both engaged and disengaged. And same way with attached. attached. Now, engaged can also be two ways. One can be engaged sinfully <coughs> or one can be engaged selfishly <coughs> or one can be engaged selflessly. Now, sinful and selfish are not the same thing. Hmm? The Sanskrit words for these are sinful engagement is vi karma. Now, is there some problem over here? In what I am explaining, I said something, I deliberately said something contradictory. I said engaged there are two categories and then I gave three categories. Is there any problem in any of the categories that you see over here? What is the problem with selflessness? It's a good thing, isn't it? Two? Yes, okay, good point. Thank you. So, so we'll come to this later. But so engage can be sinfully or selfishly. So sinful action is vi karma. That's the Sanskrit word. Vi karma is Viruddha Rupena karma. It is bad karma. Hmm. So now selfish action, it is karma kanda. Karma kanda means that I am doing action because I want the results. Hmm. And so uh, I want to, I am doing some yajna, but it's not so much for the pleasure of God. It's for the fruits that I want. And it could be karma kanda in a very broad category, where a person is largely self-centered, we could say. Now, how might the attached be disengaged? The attached could be disengaged because that person is simply irresponsible. That means I want pleasure, but I don't want to work for the pleasure. So in general, irresponsible means that we want the result, but we don't want the effort. That is the broad definition of irresponsibility. Ir now, irresponsibility can have many different meanings, but in a practical sense, if somebody is irresponsible, that means they are not doing what is expected of them. In every situation, you know, we get something, but we are expected to give something also. So, if somebody is only wanting to get, but they don't want to give, that is being irresponsible. <coughs> so, now, somebody say, oh, there's too much work over here, I don't want to do it. So, but they are not detached. They are still attached, they still want worldly pleasures. So, Krishna calls this as Mithyachari. Mithyachari is what? Achar is? Achar means? Behavior or action. Mithya is? False. Illusory. So here it's, it's not that the action is illusory, but rather it is the action is Mithya here is deceptive. It's deceptive. Deception. That means the person pretends to be a renouncer, but the person has actually not renounced. So what happens is? That person is still craving internally and whenever an opportunity comes, they will grab that opportunity. So this 
is what Krishna will warn about in 3.6 in the Bhagavad Gita. We will come to these various levels at different times in the Gita. But, so to be attached and disengaged, this is something, is that good? That's definitely not good. So we can say, this is something categorically rejected by Krishna. So, <clears throat> suppose somebody renounces the world. Somebody becomes disengaged from work. Not because they have actually become detached. But because they feel, hey, you know, maybe I'll get some prestige by being renounced. But then while having the prestige, they are also craving for pleasure. And they grab some opportunities. So then that, that becomes very deceptive. So, this I think today or tomorrow, this maybe a week or two ago, some, some movie was released <coughs> described about how in the 19th century or something like that, the British were ruling, there was some, some Swami. He claimed to be renounced, but he claimed that actually I am Krishna. And you know, he was very respected. Or I didn't just say I claimed I am Krishna or Krishna has entered into me. And then there were many women who would come and respect him. And he would tell that I see that actually Radha has entered into you. And people think, oh, you're such a limited person, you can see Radha has entered into me. You will feel that. And as Radha has entered into you, Krishna has entered into me, and we should perform Rasdila. <laughs> Prabhupada would say that is not Rasdila, that is Raskali. <laughs> <laughs> so the point is this is uh, this is coming to mainstream attention, but it is it is a widespread practice. It is anybody who has a position of power, they can abuse that power. And they can abuse that power and if you have renounced order, now this kind of activity is atrocious. So, so this is the worst thing. Krishna, now Krishna doesn't say Arjuna, you will become like this. But Krishna says that don't think that just by being detached, you are being renounced. Or being disengaged means you are detached. So it could actually backfire. So this is premature renunciation. Where a person is not mature. And some people may do this wanting to be hypocritical. But some people may not want to do like that. But if they don't have the adhikar, then over a period of time they may slide in that direction. So Krishna says to broadly speaking to Arjuna that Suppose some Kshatriya renounces the world, but then they are constantly dreaming about power and position and prestige, then that's not a healthy thing. So this is a level which is definitely to be reproached. So let's look at this verse. <coughs> karma Indriyani. So karma, in, karma Indriyani is the action senses. So the action senses are the senses with which, say, we eat food. Uh, mm -hmm. people say we engage in uh, sexual activity or reproduction so Krishna is saying karmendriyani sanyam ya. a person is restraining their senses mm -hmm. but then he says ya asate one who has what manasa smaran in his mind they are in their mind they are remembering karmendriyani sanyam ya karmendriyani sanyam ya Yasate manasasmaran. Yasate manasasmaran. So, in, what's, what are they remembering? They are not remembering Krishna. That would be wonderful. But what are they remembering? Indriyarthan. Indriyarthan is the artha of the Indra. That is, what is the normal purpose of the senses? Artha means purpose. Now the meaning of artha is. So, the normal purpose of the senses is, is to look for sense objects. So, Indriyarthan. So, Krishna says two things about such people. First of all, Vimudatma. If they think I am renounced, they are fooling themselves. Hmm? But if they make others believe that they are renounced, then they are Mithyachar. So, Sa Uchyate, such a person is called Indriyarthan Vimudatma. Indriyarthan Vimudatma. Mithyachara Sa Uchyate. Mithyachara Sa Uchyate. So, together once. Karmi Indriyani Samyamya Yasate Manasasmaran Indriyatha Vimudatma Mithyachara Sauchade So here you will see 
that there is within the tradition itself <coughs> a certain level of self criticality self criticality means that the tradition is not demanding blind faith you know anybody who is wearing this dress should you should always respect them no here shastra itself is telling us to be thoughtful to be evaluative to be evaluative to self critical means basically to be able to look at ourselves from an objective and evaluative way so many traditions their idea is that there's nothing nothing can be wrong about us or at least those who are new fights in the tradition say everything that is wrong is wrong with the world everything about us is right and if you think something is wrong with the world that is what is wrong with you <laughs> if in a, if you think something is wrong with us then that thinking is what is wrong with you no it's not like that within the tradition also unscrupulous elements can come up and unscrupulous elements can do unsavory things so now this is one thing which krishna says certainly don't do that now let's go back hmm. so we discussed about we will come back to this category later later now among the is if somebody is detached and they can be disengaged so this is broadly the path of renunciation the if somebody is detached and they are also disengaged so within this krishna will give two broad paths one is gyan yoga and the other is dhyan yoga so dhyan yoga will be talked about in chapter 6 gyan yoga will be discussed broadly from chapter 13 to 18 somebody is who has given up activity because they are actually detached from the world now when somebody is engaged although they are detached and they are engaged So Krishna says within this there are two categories. There is bhakti yoga and there is karma yoga. So karma yoga is what is going to be discussed from chapters three to six, and bhakti yoga will be discussed from chapters seven to twelve. So this is a broad overview of what is going to happen in the Bhagavad Gita. Now, at this point, Krishna will start elaborating. So we will. I'm sure you have some questions, and we will go through the questions uh, as we will try to keep time for that. But so Krishna says, when you are in, when if you are attached, giving up work, it is irresponsible. It will make you hypocritical also. So don't do that. Then Krishna says, okay, then how should we work? So Krishna says that should we work sinfully? No. no. So somebody may work, and our thief may say, "I am also working." No, in fact, I have to work very hard. When everybody sleeps, I have to stay awake and work. <laughs> well, <laughs> but no, that's work. That work is sinful work. So we karma is also something which is rejected. Now, then Krishna talks about. This point of karma kand. Now, karma kand is a technical term, but all that it means is that it is talking about working with working for something. We want something immediately, but at least we are working to get it. So, for example, now karma kand it has a technical meaning, but it has a overall or conceptual meaning. So. one some ways karma kand and karma yoga are opposite but in some ways they are very similar and how they are similar we'll discuss right now so the idea is each of us is a part of a whole bigger than ourselves every individual is a part of a larger whole now that larger whole what can it be it can be the family that we are part of it can be the community that we are a part of it can be the nation we are a part of hmm? like that it can go on and on hmm? now in each of these larger wholes that we belong to we get something from that 
but we also have to give something to them. If we don't give, if we don't contribute to that all, and if we take from it, then we will be disrupted. We will be disrupted. So, for example, if a student comes to a class, now all of you are sitting fairly crowded here and here in this class. Uh, every one of you is quite confident that this person sitting next to you is not going to suddenly turn on you and punch you in the face. <laughs> is that possible? Well, everything is possible. <laughs> but the point is, that we generally understand that if somebody has come to hear a spiritual talk, they will have a certain level of impulse control, even if they are angry about something. They will, they will conform to a certain standard of behavior. So right now all of you are sitting, some of you might be tired, some of you may not be so interested in the class. But you are here, none of you is turning your back to the speaker and looking somewhere else. <laughs> So now, normally in the classroom also what will happen, if a student is very, is completely unattentive, the teacher may tell, please you can leave the class, if you are not interested, don't disturb So, if somebody wants to be a part of a class, they are getting some knowledge over there, but then they want to, they need to have a certain behavior. Now that behavior may not be the most enjoyable behavior for them at that time. But the idea, this is where the idea of sacrifice comes in. Sacrifice means that we give up impulsive pleasure for belonging. Belonging to a larger group. So for any, way, any larger whom we want to belong to, we need to give up some impulsive pleasure. So now, if you're just sitting alone in your room, you know, you could, if you just felt like sleeping, you could sleep. If you felt like eating, you could eat. But if you want to come into the classroom atmosphere and learn, then there has to be some impulsive behavior that has to be given. Mm -hmm. Suppose somebody gets married. Then, after they get married, the, the behavior that they do has to be somewhat different from the way they might be behaving before they got married. They have to be connected and committed to one person. If we belong to a unit which is not just a couple but also a family, there's children over there. Then the children have to come first. So now normally you might consider this a sacrifice. In the tradition, this is normal duty. But every duty involves some sacrifice. And as society is becoming more and more, you could say materialistic, I don't want to use the word westernized because the West also has spirituality in it, and India also has a history of materialism. So, <laughs> so the point is, as society is becoming more and more materialistic, what happens is people become more and more self-centered. And then they do not want to give up their immediate pleasure for anything either. And that is one of the one of the reasons, among many, that people don't want to get married. Generally, when I travel abroad, I speak that how society is crumbling, even from a sociological and psychological perspective, live alone a spiritual perspective. Talk about how addictions are increasing, mental health problems are increasing, and uh, divorces are increasing. So when I went to New Zealand, then the devotees who invited me there, they hear my classes online also. They said, you know, please don't speak here, that the voices are increasing. I said, as I kept traveling, I have become more and more sensitive to what the dynamics of different places. Now, now, nowadays people don't like the word divorce at all. They say we are separated. <laughs> so, is divorce has a certain sense of harshness to it. Separated, just moved aside. Well, it's certainly the house has imploded, whatever it is. But anyway, so I thought maybe are people scarred by divorce and that's why they don't want to be reminded about it? I said, no. Actually, divorces are not increasing in the New Zealand. He says, why? How come? Because people are not getting married only. <laughs> <laughs> so now, so, so 
generally speaking if we don't if we want something without giving something then that creates imbalance in society so when this now this imbalance could be in any way like the american president who is it john f kennedy said ask not what the nation has done for you ask what you have done for the nation so now it's a reciprocal thing if we are in a particular country the country does something for us and we do something for the country but if everybody in the country is only concerned about what the country is doing for me and they're not at all concerned about what they are doing for the country then the country can't survive the country can't survive and eventually the people also won't survive because if the country collapses then eventually the individuals in that country will also not be able to sustain themselves so this you could say this is actually in one sense sacrifice in one sense it is selfless because we are doing something for someone else but in other sense sacrifice is also selfish selfless because we are giving or doing something for giving but selfish because we are giving so that we can get so like jesus said that the golden rule pandit janak ji also says something like that atma vat sarva bhutesh the idea is do unto others as you would want others to do unto you that they call as the golden rule of course in kali yuga there is another golden rule that rule is whoever has the gold rules <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that if i don't want people to be rude to me then i should not be rude to others if i am polite and well behaved does that mean necessarily everybody will be polite and well behaved not necessarily but at least there is a fair probability or at least i increase the probability that people will be polite and well behaved so in one sense i am restraining my urge to yell at someone because they have done something to upset me but in other sense i am doing it for my own good so this principle of sacrifice krishna illustrates at the level of the universe he says that we are taking now at one level for us this is the family it's easy to understand this for example with respect to the country it's easy to understand this now if everybody in the country takes the facilities but nobody pays the taxes then how will the country's government run so it's easy to understand but krishna says this applies at the level of the universe also so we are taking from the universe and we need to give back to the universe so this awareness is increasing in society nowadays because the environment is being entire increasingly jeopardized because of indiscriminate industrialization the deforestation the desertification of the top soil the destruction of biodiversity there is a lot of environment problem that are likely to come and that's why we have become more as they say first they said greed is good now they say green is good not greed is good greed means you just get more and more and more and the idea of the industrialization economic development will lead to good but now i saying we have to be eco friendly so the idea is that when we belong to a larger whole we should contribute to that larger whole so that we can get back from that other so here krishna uses the word lok sangraha in fact this word will come twice lok sangraha means maintenance of the world sangraha is maintenance it's all sangraha means coming together or accumulation but accumulation in a systematic way maintenance of the world here loka is the word loka has two different meanings one is world and other like mrutyu loka swarga loka now loka in the vernacular also means people so the idea is that the loka is maintained by the loka the world people actually maintain the world and then the world maintains the people so every one of us is a part of a larger society and we need to play our part in that society 
So, uh, now, right now, we're using sound system. Now, whoever designed the sound system, whoever developed the technology, whoever actually implemented the technology, they have done a fairly decent job. That's why we are able to use the technology. So, we are all taking from society. <laughs> so, we need to give back to society. So that is the broad idea. Now, what is the specific over here that the implication for Arjuna? Now, Arjuna has a particular role in society. He is a warrior. Now, as a warrior, he is a king, a leader, a kshatriya. A kshatriya gets from society <coughs> prestige. Kshatriya is highly honored. Kshatriya gets power gets position but a kshatriya needs to offer in return protection and protection requires fighting sometimes protection may be defensive but even for defense fighting is required so krishna is telling arjuna that you are a part of society and you need to do your duty of fighting if you do not do your duty, then the result will be that you will be acting sinfully. Now, now Arjuna's situation is exceptional. His situation is he has to fight against his relatives. But you know, our dedication to duty that is largely tested. Is it tested in the easy times? Or is it tested in tough times? Tough times? Generally, it is tested in tough times, isn't it? Say, if a soldier is there on the war field, uh, is there on the border, whenever there is peace, and whenever there comes a news that war is about to start, the soldier says, Oh, I have family emergency, I have to go back. Soldier comes up with some excuse and says, I don't want to fight. Now, okay. Nobody may want to kill. Some people, of course, like to kill. But generally, uh, it's, it's, it's not a pleasant thing to kill people. You may not want to be part of violence, you don't want to be killed. But whenever the duty starts demanding difficult things from us, if we start saying, I won't do it, then that won't work. If the government pays salary to the soldiers, and the citizens are paying salary to soldiers, and the soldiers, at the time of war, say, okay, you know, we are going to take you right. That won't work. So, our dedication to duty is tested in tough times. So, it is, Arjuna has to do a duty in difficult situations. It is that, he has to fight a war which is difficult. It has to fight against his own relatives. But, that is what he is meant to do. So, he says, Krishna will talk about these two levels, that you are a part of a larger whole, you have to contribute to the larger whole. Now here Krishna talks about the concept of Yajna, which I will not go into, because that's not so immediately relevant, we don't talk about sacrifices and fire sacrifice in today's world. But the more important principle is the principle of sacrifice. So, sacrifice means that when we seek belonging to a larger whole, we need to be ready to give up our impulses. Which, may pre which prevent, especially those impulses which prevent us from belonging to the larger world. So now, Arjuna may say, so, so for Arjuna the choice is, he says that if you are attached, then definitely you need to be engaged. Isn't it? If you are attached to the prestige that the position of Kshatriya gives, then you need to be engaged to offer protection. Now Arjuna may say, what if I am detached? <coughs> so this is the possibility that is implied from 311 to 16. Mm -hmm. Now when he says, what about detached? That's what will be discussed in the next section. But before we go there, let's look at... So, why, oh, why, Krishna, do you want me to fight if attaining peace through wisdom is what's right? 
This was the question which led to Vyami Shrini Vavakki. The words are confusing to me. So, paths at two distinct levels, says Krishna, have I earlier taught. Through both action and renunciation, inner peace is to be sought. So, he said, I am talking about inner peace, not outer peace. And you can get it through action and through renunciation. Renouncing externally while craving internally makes one a deceiver. That's a mithyachara. Of purification through detached beautifulness, one becomes the receiver. So this, when we act in a beautiful way, we gradually become purified. How is that? When we belong to a larger whole, we subordinate some of our impulses. We give up those impulses. And that's how gradually we become purified of those impulses. One becomes the receiver. Sacrifice is what brings humans into cosmic alignment. Now, in the head, Krishna uses the specific example of the cosmos. But as I said, it applies to every larger unit that you belong to. If you don't sacrifice, then we are misaligned with the universe. Ret returning what the universe has given brings contentment. When we are accepted, when we are rightfully belonging to any larger unit, now that brings a joy. Say, if we are belonging to a family and we are valued and respected in the family, if we are belonging to a community and we are valued and accepted and respected in the community, that brings contentment. And same applies to the universe also. Thus are the universal debts paid by the attached while they progress smoothly toward becoming detached. Because they are disciplining some of their impulses, gradually they are becoming increasingly detached. It will happen. And now, this is the issue that we will discuss. Those already detached have no reason to do dutiful work. Yet, being free from temptation, they have no reason not to work. The detached work to set an example for the world. So the attached can have a safe path beyond the world. So Arjuna may say that I am not interested in the kingdom. So I don't have to fight. I will live in the forest as a simple mendicant. So he says, that, yes, you can do that. But what is the lesson people are going to draw from it? Most people will think that Arjuna renounced his work because his duty, because the going became tough for him. Because the duty became difficult for him. Say, and what will happen is, people will take that example and they will all start dodging their duty whenever it becomes difficult for him. Say, if somebody is the head of a hospital and there's a pandemic, a lot of workload, a lot of risk, and the head of the chief doctor in the hospital says that, okay, now I'm going only you. Uh, everybody will think, why are you going on leave now? Yeah. Because you don't want the risk. You don't want the trouble of extra work. And people say, okay, why should we all work? And then things percolate down. And Krishna says, so now, so the detached work responsibly, by that what happens? The attached get an example. Okay, we should also work. This person, this level, this person could take, a, could get an excuse. But this person is not taking an excuse. Therefore, I should also not take an excuse. This was the verse, Yadhya Rachar Visveshtam. And then, even I, the Lord, do my duty forever, although I have no obligation whatsoever. Krishna is not bound. Krishna, we talk about Krishna's position later when they come to the, uh, to the uh, nine, uh, seventh chapter. But basically, in when we are talking about these various holes, there is an individual and a family could be one hole, the community could be one hole, the nation could be one hole, the humanity could be another hole, the biosphere itself could be another hole. Like that, all these holes, they are ultimately contained in the supreme hole. And that is Krishna. Aham sarvasya prabhu mattaha sarvam prabhati. So although Krishna may take a role by which he appears to come in this world, but as Krishna is in this world, Krishna is not a limited member of this world like everybody else. Mm -hmm. Even when Krishna is inside the world, the world is inside Krishna. Mm -hmm. That is that is shown later in the 11th chapter in the Vishwarupa. So Krishna does not have to strive to belong to any larger world. 
Because Krishna is the ultimate one. Krishna says, when I come, even I do my duties. So there are five because we want to set an example. So when Krishna who would be the king of Dwarka, you know, he uh, would not just en- he was not just enjoying, he was actually doing royal duties. He was respecting the sages, he was performing sacrifices, he was doing charity to the citizens. He was doing his duty. So that is what Krishna is saying over here. And then Then he says, but you know, if you are, if the somebody is detached, then why should Dwadinetis set an example for everyone else? Can't he just give instruction to them, you should also become detached. Mm-hmm. So Krishna says a key point over here. He says that instruction should not cause unnecessary agitation. It should not cause others unnecessary agitation, but show them customize to their level the path to elevation. This is the verse we'll discuss now. And this is 326 in the Gita. Na buddhi bhedam janayed Na buddhi bhedam janayed So janayed is people in general. Buddhi bhedam is disturbance of the intelligence, disruption of the intelligence. It says don't disturb people's mind and intelligence. Na buddhi bhedam Who's which people? Agyanam karma sanginam. Agyanam karma sanginam. So agyanam karma sanginam means those who are attached and those who are agyanam, they are ignorant. And so such people's minds should not be disturbed. Joshayet sarva karmani. Joshayet sarva karmani. So joshayet means to dovetail, to link properly. Vidvan Yukta Samacharan. Vidvan Yukta Samacharan. So the wise people, they guide people to be gradually elevated. Vidvan Yukta Samacharan. So let's try to understand what this verse is saying. It's like saying there are two levels of people. There is one person who is detached and wise. The another person who is attached and ignorant. So what Krishna is saying is that when we are instructing people, we should not expect them to suddenly take a leap. What is likely to happen is you tell them, oh you know why are you so ignorant? You just become become enlightened and become detached. What likely to happen is they will try to jump up and they will go further down. So, if somebody is asked to do something which they are not capable of doing, then that will lead to them attempting it and then it backfiring on them. So, instead, what is Krishna recommending? Krishna says, Jo Shayet Saro. Is the color visible? So, he says, gradually create steps for them. By gradual steps, elevate them. Get them to the higher level. So, how does this happen? It is a pathway has to be made. Okay, you are here right now. From here, where can you go? This is a step you can take. So, many times say, if we consider some students, you know, they want to, they, they get introduced to bhakti and they start thinking, oh, this all engineering studies, it's all mundane, it's agyana, it's avidya. I don't want to study this. I want to completely, I want to renounce the world. Mm-hmm. Now, what happens is, most of the time, what we tell, now this is what was done in America. If somebody wants to join, they would just told you can just join the temple. It happened in the 1960s and 1970s. But at that time, the social structure is very different and people were not, uh, the people who were joining our movement from the counterculture. So, in, uh, in that particular thought, the education was not so much emphasized. It didn't make much difference. But in India, uh, often say, students ask, how can I preach to my friends? He says, he says how can I make my friends into devotees? So the first thing we tell them is that study well. 
Now, by studying well, there is no guarantee that your friends will become devotees. But if you don't study well, there is a guarantee they won't become devotees. <laughs> Isn't it? Because if they start seeing that, oh, you know, this person became a devotee and they start neglecting their studies, they start becoming irresponsible, in their view. And they say, I don't want to be a part of this. Now, of course, some people may want to be a part of it. But those are the kind of people we don't want. <laughs> those who are simply looking for an excuse to not study. Hmm? And then for them, spirituality becomes an excuse. So I remember when, uh, many years before I was in IIT, I was used to go to IIT KGB. So one boy, he came and said that. The IIT KGB, maybe somewhere else, where it is. So anyway, so he said that. Mm, I want to join the temple. I have just been introduced for four or five months. I want to go full time Brahmacharya. So I said, you know, you just you know, kind of continue practicing bhakti. We have, uh, if you see our youth centers, they are there in a step by step approach. Now you come, chant a few rounds, come for a few, come for evening programs, and if you feel comfortable, then you can stay, you can do the morning sadhana, and gradually you can take more responsibility. So gradual step by step elevation path. <laughs> He went away. Then after a couple of days, he came back. He said, I, I was reading the Bhagavatam today and I got a realization. I said, Okay. So he said that I just, you know, I just surrendered to Krishna. And I said, Krishna, whatever you want to tell me, you tell me. So he said, I just opened the Bhagavatam and I came to the past time of Bali Maharaj and Shukracharya. And Bali Maharaj wanted to surrender to Krishna. Hmm? And Shukracharya told him no. So he said, <laughs> so, the realization that I got is that I am like Bali Maharaja, you are like Shukraja. <laughs> so he said, for the sake of surrendering to Lord Vishnu, I reject you as my guide. And then he just went from there directly to Mayapur. And he said, I want to join the temple. Now, he joined the temple, he stayed there for two, three months. And then, he just left Mayapur. And then he just said, I'm going to go to the Himalayas now. <laughs> and then in the Himalayas, and after some days, he just came back home. And he was living in his home, not even studying, not even, uh, neither studying nor practicing any serious spirituality. So what happens is, that is, for many people, Spirituality can be the form of escapism. So, in one case, a person may be sincere, but they may not be able to do it. Other cases, that the person may not be sincere and they may use spirituality as an excuse. So, both ways, so if we give um, Adama, um, let's put it this way, if we give inappropriate guidance, inappropriate guidance. What that means is, basically, hmm, the guidance is too advanced for the person. Then what is likely to happen is, one is, they will become discouraged, they will try, they will fail, and then they will go away. <coughs> yeah, I just can't do this. Hmm. So, I was in Silicon Valley and uh, uh, I met one boy. He said that he had come to maybe 2007 or 2008. His introduction was I had gone to IIT KGP and he had given a class over. I had given a youth program over there, like a, a youth meeting, and that was his first introduction. Another, so he said, I liked it, I loved the philosophy. But he said, I found the standards. Uh, I, I came, I started staying in the youth center. I found centers very different, standards very difficult. So, and then I just left, I felt so guilty. And now he said, then I, I still want to practice spirituality. So he said that then I wanted to see which spiritual organization I could actually follow. Then he went to my other organization and he's an active part of that. And now he's one of the biggest funders and biggest patrons and uh, even teachers in that organization. And when he met me, I talked with him, then he showed me some of the things that he's doing. He's actually also teaching the Bhagavad Gita. He's doing in one sense, all the part of the other thing is doing good work. A lot of vigor. He's also very successful professionally in his particular field of software coding uh, or software development broadly. 
He is among the top five people. It's a small field, but he's a very, very successful owner. So then I asked him that what was it that was so, oh, what was the standard that you felt you can't follow? He said that, you know, I was told that I should read only Prabhupada's books. And he said, since the age I was seven, you know, every week I read two books. There's not a single year when I have not read a hundred books. He says, I am an avid reader. I have no interest in movies. I have no interest in sports. I just love to read books. And I asked what kind of book is it? It's not just novels and science fiction or something like that. He likes to read, read biographies, he likes to read uh, uh, personal growth kind of books. So he said, I can't give this up. And that's why I gave up Krishna consciousness. Now, is we all should read Prabhupada's books, but is don't read any other books that important a principle? No, see, most for most people, reading books is like assignment, <laughs> isn't it? And then, if they are, if they start reading a hundred other books, then what will happen? They will not read Shastra. But for some people, reading books is their their life. And then, if you constrict them, then it's just not going to work. It's like somebody is a very musically oriented person, and you tell them you should hear only Prabhupada Hare Krishna, no other. No other songs, no other kirtan also. They will feel musically suffocated. <laughs> so, sometimes we make Krishna consciousness more difficult than it needs to be. So, we don't want to give instruction that is impossible for the person to follow. And that's why a personal guide is required. A guide who understands the person. And the guide should also be such that, not just like the guide have one formula, they just repeat it to everyone. Yeah, do this, do this, do this, do this. No. That's why individual attention is required. The individual situation needs to be understood. So, I was thinking it's such a sad thing. You know, for such a small thing, he left Krishna consciousness. And he's still doing good work. And uh, so I asked him how he came and met me. He said that he sometimes hears my classes and he said that you know, he finds my classes quite broad minded. So, he said that that's why I thought I'd want to come and meet him. So I felt very sad that this is what happened. Don't disturb people's minds. Unnecessary. So there are standards that are important. But the point is standards are for elevating people. Standards are not for suffocating people. Isn't it? If some standards are suffocating people, then that means like say it's like if you go to some traditional temples, you know, the steps are quite big. Isn't it? And imagine somebody wants to go mountain climbing. There, you know, there will not be any steps at all. You have to like hold your arms and pull yourself up. Now, only the most adventurous people will go and do some mountain climbing like that. But if you want people to come to a temple, then if the step is very big, then maybe you have to create smaller steps. So that is instruction to be given according to time, place, circumstances. Now after this, Krishna will continue and he will say that. Actually, what is important that that actually whether one is engaged or disengaged, whether one, that is not the most important thing. What is one's consciousness? Whether one is attached or detached, that is more important. Somebody may be detached and still they may be engaged. And they should not be equated with the person who is attached or engaged. They are two different levels. So this is where Krishna gives the famous verse. And don't think of yourself as a doer. Prakriti Kriya Manani. So, doing action or announcing action, that's not the key matter. Thinking we are the doers, that's the illusion to shatter. That if I think I am renouncing the world, then in the karta bhav, oh, I am a great person, I renounce the world. Then that will actually backfire. That will lead to one's ego getting boosted. Say if somebody, if there's Ekadashi, we said there's Nijal Ekadashi. They suppose somebody fasts. And while they're fasting, then they're watching who is going to the kitchen and who is eating what. <laughs> and throughout the day, they're actually doing a vigil. Watching everyone who's eating and they're thinking, oh, this person is so attached. That's a sense gratifier. No sense control at all. <laughs> Don't person. 
then body may be fasting, but then ego is feasting. <laughs> and they will not make much spiritual advancement. So, that I am the doer. Oh, I am the announcer. See how great I am. That's the illusion to shatter. So the real thing is to give up ego, to develop humility. And then, Krishna talks about the importance of faith. We'll discuss faith in a later chapter. But faith in these, the words takes one to liberation. What are the words? That the externals don't matter as much as the internals. Externals matter, but internals matter much more. Doubt keeps one misdirected, stuck in illusion. Then Krishna tells Arjuna that you are a Kshatriya, you need to act according to Kshatriya. That you can't artificially become a Brahmana and announce the world. According to their nature, act, acts everyone, even the wise. By repression alone, no one can become free from virus. There is a difference between regulation and repression. Repression means that we are completely uh, causing our desires to be suffocated. And that happens, they will explode sooner or later. So, now in Bhakti, I will I'll come, I'll come to this point and conclude this. But being true to one's own nature is always better then doing something else even if it seems less bitter. So for Arjuna, fighting seems to be a bitter thing and becoming a Brahman, like a, becoming like a Brahman announcing the world, living in the forest, that might seem less bitter. Krishna says, that's not what you are meant to do, that's not what is your nature. Then, this theme we have discussed yesterday, God is speaking, but let's go over this. Here Arjuna asks the question. What Arjuna asks pushes us towards self-destruction forcing us to act even against our own good intention. That we all have, seem to have this urge which pulls us, drags us almost towards doing the things we don't want to do. So, the desire that rages against moral boundaries is the world's enemy. See, karma is there in everyone. But Krishna says, karmesha krodesha. So the karma that is filled with krodha towards dharma. The karma that, see, Ravan had lust. But why is Ravan, everybody has lust. But Ra, why is Ravan consider, considered the embodiment of lust? Because his lust didn't respect any boundaries. Wherever he would go, he would just find anyone attracted and force himself on. He violated Ramba, he tried to violate Vedavati, he abducted Sita. So the karma that has Krodha against Dharma. Dharma means he has the boundaries. We all have desires, but desires need to be within boundaries. If I want to eat some good food, I can't just break into a hotel and eat the food from there. I need to earn the money, I need to pay the money. That is dharma. So, desire, calm itself, see, lust itself is not the problem. Lust is a part of our biological condition. But, it is lust that is filled with growth. Krodha for any kind of boundaries. Why should there be any boundaries? That is a deadly thing. So the desire that rages against boundaries is the world's enemy. Blocking us from the life-saving inside, the craving inside me is not me. Okay, this desire might be there within me, but that is not who I am. But the more we identify with our desires, the more our identity becomes reduced. Like say somebody identifies with their desire of drinking alcohol. The more they identify the desire, the more their identity will become that of alcoholic. But I understand, okay, this is a desire that's come within me. The desires come, they stay, they go. So there are people, now everybody has lust, but there are people who become sex addicts, they become sex maniacs. How does it happen? And because they identify so much with their desire. So there is a desire inside me, but that is not me. That is just something coming from my conditions. So, but when there is karma with krodha, then that blinds us. The desire, it blocking us, blocking, it doesn't allow us to get this inside. It strips away not just all our knowledge, but also our desire to know. Jnana vijnana nashana Krishna says. That not only that I am a spiritual being, that knowledge goes away, but even the tendency to inquire about spirituality, it goes away. It is 
that I just it, like when a person is filled with sensual desires, filled with lust, then that person naturally considers others to be their body and consider themselves to be their own body. It just lust locks us in bodily consciousness and we don't want to think about anything else. So this is the when this happens it kills away not only our knowledge but also our desire. I don't care for anything else. So this kind of karma, karma that is filled with krodha, it is dangerous for everyone. Krishna says the it is the world's enemy. Last, what it does it? It can transform men into monsters. And it can transform women into witches. So it is lust is gender neutral. It is not that lust afflicts only one gender or another gender. It attracts, it afflicts everyone. And Krishna is telling that it is. It is not just a, okay, one time I indulge, what is the big deal? No, the more, when we indulge, each indulgence is actually blinding us. It is blocking our spirituality. So it will block us and we will just not be able to perceive anything spiritual at all. So, that is, uh, what happened to Ravan was, even when people gave him good advice, he, he had no desire for any good advice. In fact, he condemned those who were giving him good advice. Then it strips away not just our knowledge but also our desire to know. It feels like a fire scorching us from inside, leaving us nowhere to go. So this is actually a big, big problem. Normally, if say we are very close to a fire, we can go away from that fire. But when the fire of lust comes, it is, is inside us. Where can we go from it? There's nowhere to go. And especially what happens is, when we see nowadays there are movies and there is so much sensuality available freely, and we think, oh, people are enjoying. We see the externals, people are having fun. Uh, people are enjoying. Yeah, maybe there is some pleasure over there. It's tiny, but there is some pleasure. It's like an intoxicating pleasure. But the problem is, the more people indulge, the more lust burns from within. And as the lust burns from within, it just makes their life a torment. And now we can say this fire is there in everyone. And it is true. But the problem is that when the fire is there in everyone, normally if there is a fire, the intelligent thing to do is go away from the fire. But what happens is, this is the fire where society tells us to put more and more fuel in the fire, to go closer and closer to the fire. And that is while externally you might see people are enjoying, but internally people are burning. They are burning with their desire. And their indulgence is just like a desperate attempt to get some relief from that fire. So a little bit relief. But you get little relief. But then what happens? After that, the fire blazes further. It's like, I'll make this one last point. This, I'll say one more last point. Say, assume. Okay. Okay, my drawing is poor, so. Say, assume this is fire. <laughs> okay. Now, it's a flame. Now, normally speaking, what happens is if we put drops of fuel into the fire, what will happen? The fire will burn. That's understandable. But if instead of if instead of putting drops of fire, drops of fuel, we put a block of firewood. What will happen? <coughs> the fire will seem to have died out. But it will seem to have died out till the wood catches fire. By firewood, I mean inflammable wood. So, once the once it catches fire, the, the wood catches fire. Actually, it will burn even more, isn't it? So, actually, what people call as enjoyment is largely just a relief from torment. Torment means the inner burning that is there. 
so when we enjoy what happens is that that fire we have put a block of wood on it but this block of wood is not enough to extinguish the fire now everybody has this experience that when we indulge we get we get feeling this big pressure internally and you can do it do it do it do it do it and we do it and then we feel some relief but what happens after that does the relief stay forever no afterwards what happens is that the desire comes forth and it comes stronger so maybe it's it's like the experience of sense enjoyment maybe initially there is some pleasure <coughs> yes and the senses come in contact with sense objects there is some pleasure but over a period of time that pleasure just becomes a relief it's initially what happens is the here you could say the fire is low okay like somebody some somebody takes a uh, alcohol or uh, drugs for the first time there is no craving inside them but what happens is they take the alcohol hey maybe i feel high i feel good i feel i feel nice so there maybe there is some pleasure but here the fire of craving is low but here what happens is the fire starts becoming high and then there is that fire is high so it's not so much pleasure that it is just a relief oh this is burning within and i just need some relief so we will see the same thing when we do it repeatedly it doesn't give enjoyment but it doesn't give enjoyment but still we can't stop doing it because the fire is burning so much all that we need is relief and then after that when the fire becomes unbearable then it is it is just it's like a, we are basically just trying to run away from ourselves ourselves means our in this case our inner world our mind is filled with grief so it is just a desperate attempt to run away from ourselves so it is it is still relief only but like a desperately needed relief and then by that time this is the stage where a person has become an addict addiction is not just a desire has become too strong that you cannot resist it is rather the the non indulgence is so painful that the relief is needed whatever be the cost generally addiction broadly has three characteristics to it one is the craving is very strong craving is high then the second is there is the there even if one gets consequence what that means we do something we get in trouble but the consequence does not lead to any decrease one of the cases of addiction is that sometimes people say just give somebody negative enforcement punish the person and then they will not do it again well it's not that simple they will be punished but the torment is so much within that no matter what consequence comes they just want to do it you know you if you peddle drugs you will be put in jail i don't want to go to jail but you go to jail and in jail you become a part of some gang over there so that somebody will give you drugs over there so the consequence does not cause any deterrence and basically what has happened is the control is almost zero not zero but almost zero that means the person just can't say no so that means what is happening is the craving inside is very very difficult to bear and the external consequence it doesn't make any difference and the person the behavior it just goes out of control so this is a very deadly state to be i repeat this what i mean i repeat it another way so it's like if a person is an addict so what is happening is inside their head there is a craving the craving is very high 
and now the second is even if consequence comes the consequence just falls off it has no effect on them and the third is that it's like there's no control they have they are almost on an automaton that i just have to do this it's many times people who are addicted to this is i feel as if something else has taken over me it's like i have no control i'm watching as i'm doing it but it's it's almost as if i'm not doing it i'm doing it but i have no control to stop myself from doing it so this is a very deadly state to get into and it's important that we protect ourselves so now here krishna repeats the same two points that we talked about earlier one is boundaries you remember i said talked about how we to eda mm, that like uh, we create boundaries and the second is we pursue a higher taste the same principle krishna talks about but overall the here krishna gives a deeper analysis of the psychological dynamics how things grow so overall this lust is a very dangerous thing especially when it is filled with krodha krodha against boundaries so feel like a fire scorching us from inside leaving us no way to go then what is to be free for seek sensory regulation and prevent desires aggravation so don't give don't put further fuel on it don't watch don't touch don't oh, you have some regulation that this is what krishna says in 340 341 actually the soul you are above the intelligence mind and senses seek this conviction fight firmly the enemy who will torment you till its elimination krishna says this is nitya vairana nitya vairana means arjuna you may consider karana is your enemy and karana will kill you but this last will not spare you even after killing you after killing you will follow your next life will keep tormenting your next life also. so till its elimination it will keep tormenting you fight firmly the enemy will torment you to till its elimination slay it slay it fully by realizing your spiritual connection the more we connect with krishna evam buddhe param buddhva the more we become situated in our connection with krishna more we find satisfaction in our connection with krishna the more we find that the craving for worldly things will start diminishing and disappearing so let's summarize what we discussed today so we started by discussing this chapter three overview so the first was point of arjuna's confusion so arjuna's confusion is that he feels krishna has talked right could talk right ambivalent it's both ways he is speaking so krishna clarifies to arjuna that the fundamental clarification is that arjuna is equally equating externals with internals he is equating outer peace and inner peace specifically so krishna said they are not equal what that means is the if somebody is engaged that does not mean that they are attached and somebody is disengaged does not mean that they are detached so this is where we went elaborately in the analysis that krishna says that when somebody is somebody could be engaged and somebody could be disengaged so they could be disengaged because they are de- detached they could be disengaged when they are attached also that is because they want to be they are either themselves deceived or they are deceivers so they are either vimudha or they are mithyachari now uh, somebody is dis- engaged and disengaged and detached they could either be gyan yogis or dhyan yogis somebody is engaged and they could also be detached or attached so if they are engaged and attached then they could be selfish uh, they could be sinfully <coughs> or selfish so this is karma kanda and vikarma and karma kanda and then there is 
they could be engaged and detached that is bhakti yoga and karma yoga so this part of the pilaska education sometimes means to show how the simple is not so simple that it is complex and then krishna we talk about the concept of sacrifice so sacrifice basically means it is the sanskrit word is yagya we don't want to sanskrit specifics but sacrifice means basically we give up our impulses impulses are given up for for what for belonging belonging to a larger whole we discuss how any of us when we belong to a larger whole we are getting something and we need to be giving something so sacrifice in that sense can be seen to be both selfish because we are getting something but it is also selfless because at least we are giving up our lower urges our impulses then we discussed about that set the importance of the detached they set what they should do with respect to the attached is set example and not give set example yes give disruptive instruction should they do that no certainly not it is disruptive instruction means somebody is here and here we should encourage them not to go up all the way because all that they will end up doing is mostly go down so instead we give them a gradual pathway up so that they reach the destination so this was nabuddhi bhedam janaye the key point is not so much what we have to renounce is not action itself but the idea of doership doership is i am the doer that pride is what has to be renounced so somebody can renounce action and they can have the pride of doership and they will still get entangled and then the last part we discussed was about this inner enemy the inner enemy is basically this karma with krodha against what boundary. against boundary boundary is there is dharma so dharma basically has many different meanings but in this context dharma refers to boundaries that karma is natural but karma that rejects boundaries that is destructive and we discuss elaborately how now this is a fire inside so where can we run away from the fire no running away and then we what happens when we uh, put fuel the fuel of indulgence we get relief and we mistake the relief to be pleasure but actually what happens is with time the pleasure starts decreasing and the relief doesn't increase but rather the need for relief starts increasing because the inner fire becomes so much more that the need for relief starts increasing and that's where we discuss the three c's when there is craving that is out of uh, then the craving that keeps tormenting a person when consequences don't stop the person and when the control seems to be going away that's where a person tends to become an addict so by recognizing how dangerous this inner enemy is and by connecting with krishna we all can actually become free from this inner enemy so any questions or comments yes who has a mic yes please is there a mic yeah i wanted to ask like how a person goes from this attached level to the detached level that you mentioned the steps now mm. so how does one goes from uh, goes to that level and uh, the sacrifice that you mentioned over there is it under the karma kanda or karma yoga it can sacrifice can it depends on what we are thinking of belonging so if <coughs> see karma yoga is more nishka mm. karma kanda is definitely sakha so like somebody may be joining the military why because they are very poor they don't have option for any other job so they are not really interested in serving the country they are interested only the salary that the benefits that the military gives them that's okay at least they are doing their work but maybe they spend time in the military they are associated with other people in the military who are uh, who are who love the country 
and by actually uh, doing their duty, they guys should develop love for the country. And then they start working out of love for the country. So what happens is that it's like the motivation can move from more selfish to less selfish. So like that, a person may initially be doing something because, you know, it's for my family. Now, in today's world, if somebody can actually take care of their family, that is laudable. Because most people just find their responsibility too complex and people don't care for it. So that's laudable. But if one cares for the family, gradually if they develop a sense of responsibility. It could happen that their consciousness gets stuck in the family itself. But it can expand gradually. From family, it can go towards nation. Prabhupada talks about his nectar of devotion. It can go towards community, it can go towards nation. So what happens is that when we learn to restrain our impulses, basically, and we do some service. So basically there are two opposite things. There is, there is um, gratification. That means we are doing something for our pleasure. And there is contribution. So what happens is, if we can somehow restrain gratification and try to do some contribution, then gradually what happens is this taste starts coming. So it's like say if we get some we get some delicious prasad. And you say, okay, you know, I got this prasad, this is sweet, I want to eat all of it. We get some pleasure. But you know, oh, we have some friends and we share that prasad with them. And uh, it gives us a different kind of joy. You know, we give somebody some nice food, nice food and they feel happy with it. And then you start discovering that actually giving also gives pleasure. Initially, think giving means losing. But we start realizing that giving also gives some pleasure. And as that realization starts increasing, then eventually they are giving towards Krishna. That gives the greatest pleasure. So by starting giving even in a small way, gradually that person will grow. And they will move towards mm, giving themselves fully to Krishna. So in, in, in this question itself, the selfish is tending towards uh, karma kanda and yes. selfless is tending towards karma. Yes. Uh, like selfless person is a karma. Yes. Now the karma also are different levels. Sorry, selflessness can also be different levels. That means the karma yogi can be seeking liberation. Bhakti yogi is seeking Krishna's pleasure. So selflessness can also be at a different levels in that sense. Yeah. Which is just like you were saying that if you are taking from the society and family, then it is a responsibility to give them. Just like uh, Krishna was sharing to Arjuna. So we see that uh, many, many people in early stage they renounce their family and uh, society and only dedicated to Krishna. And they are serving best in the Krishna, but they are not serving their family and the society. Is it right or wrong? Yeah. I, I would have found it disturb me if nobody had asked that question. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you asked it. See, Krishna at one level falls in a different category. Like I said, there are these different categories and different holes we belong to and Krishna is the ultimate hole. Now Krishna is not just the ultimate hole. Krishna is the largest hole who contains everything. But he doesn't just contain everything, he also sustains everything. So all the other holes are maintained by Krishna. Let's say for example, when a mother has a newborn child, the mother offers a breast milk. That's one of the most intimate acts of love. And that's certainly the mother's love which is to be praised. At the same time, the mother didn't do anything special to produce milk in her breasts. But the same Krishna who sent a child through her womb into this world also sent milk in the mother's breast for that child. So that milk is the mother's love for the child and it is Krishna's love for the child. Both. So that's why it is said that if we can, if we are serving Krishna wholeheartedly, then we don't have to serve any other rules. That 
Sarvatmanaya Sapanam Sharanyam. What is that verse? You remember? Devashirinamata. That's that basically that uh, when we are serving the Lord, then all our debts to all other holds are already paid. So that is the philosophical principle. Now having said that, it is important that we still, because we are functioning society, we still try to do our best. So for example, generally devotees are not encouraged to uh, renounce the world prematurely. If somebody has family responsibility, their sisters to be married or they have some debts. They should, they should do at least to some degree the obligation to the parents. Now, I am based in the lower Dhanika village in, uh, in near Mumbai. And there we are, the, we are creating a whole building which is simply for Brahmacharya's parents. And the parents don't have to pay anything over there. They can stay. They will have provided food. And there is a, there is a residential doctor who, can, who will, uh, the doctor couple is there. They will take care of the medical needs. And uh, of course, the parents may have some savings and other things. They can have, but we are trying to create some facilities. We are not just abandoning our parents. And uh, if someone has already entered into a relationship, say if everyone is married, then they cannot renounce it. Then that's Prabhupada himself, as Guru Maharaj told him, you know, preach Krishna Mahasaya all over the world. And Prabhupada said that if uh, I had not been married, I would have joined my Guru Maharaj mission immediately. But he said, now that I was married, I had a child, it would have been unfair to them. So Prabhupada did his family responsibilities. So we, yes, in principle, if you are serving Krishna, then we don't have to do anything for anyone else. But in practice, we want to reciprocate. And we want to do. The inspiration to serve Krishna is there. And sometimes, even in ordinary life, for a higher cause, or sometimes another cause, a lower cause has to sacrifice. No family will want to have their child go to the battlefield. But sometimes for the service of the country, that's required. And if that happens, then actually it is the responsibility of society and the responsibility of the country to actually take care of their family, take care of those parents who have given their child for the country. So there is at an individual level as well as a societal level the attempts to take care of the other responsibilities also. Many times uh, when I speak in colleges, sometimes uh, not nowadays, but maybe ten years ago it was very common. Uh, I didn't know that. You know, you were an engineer, but you became a you became a brahmachari. So you say India lost an engineer. I said, no, India didn't lose an engineer. America lost an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> so I was very clearly I have my maternal uncle has his own company in America, and he didn't have any son, so he wanted me to come there and inherit the company. So uh, I would not have stayed here. So in one sense, although I am not serving India as an engineer. Now, I'm serving India in a different way. You know, Indian culture, Indian spirituality, Indian wisdom, tradition. I'm trying to share it among Indians, I'm trying to share it across the world. So each of us, we try to contribute. So in principle, we have to understand that. Serving Krishna means we don't have any other debts. In practice, we try to manage as much as we can, both at an individual level as well as a societal level. That we try to take care of things. Because in that particular situation, that was Arjuna's responsibility. See, Krishna's will is different at different times. What is Krishna's will? See, for Arjuna, it was to engage, to be engaged. For Parikshit Maharaj, it was to be disengaged. When he was cursed, he could also have said, actually, I am, I am protecting dharma. And let me try to fight against this curse. And let me try to counter this curse. So Krishna can have different will for different people. Krishna wanted to use Arjuna's archery skills to establish Dharma in the world. So that, so that is Krishna's will. That's what he did. So while the Gita's specific message is to engage with the world, but the broader principle is to harmonize with the will of God. To do the will of God. The specific will of God so externally, internally, uh, sorry, situationally, rather, the will will be different. So for Arjuna it was to be an instrument of Krishna's will for fighting and establishing them. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, Guru, my, uh, my doubt is regarding, uh, like you said, the concept of don't disturb the minds of other people. So, uh, like uh, one day, I, uh, like uh, one of my friends, uh, he, he, was, he uh, did like some kind of spirituality, uh, like he had the philosophy of impersonalism and he, he was uh, determined in that. But I, I spoke about this Krishna consciousness and uh, gave this, like uh, in enthusiasm kind of thing. So, uh, what happened like, he became detached from that philosophy also and he did not pick, uh, pick up this philosophy also. Like, he became kind of materialistic after that. Some kind of spiritual, uh, like, he was a uh, kind of spiritual person before that, uh, in different way, but he now became a fully materialistic person. Yeah. So, uh, so what should I have done in that type of conversation? Yeah, thank you for the candle in sharing that. It, it is, uh, see there are, our <laughs> preaching sometimes has products and sometimes has casualties. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, it's like you know, preaching, products is not the best word, maybe you can say. Where preaching we get trophies. Now, so many people became devotees. But then there are also casualties. Like an army goes to fight, then we want to get some treasure from the opposite kingdom and show that this is what we want. But while they are going along, there will be casualties. Now the attempt should be to try to minimize the casualties. A responsible army will try to always minimize the casualties. So, generally, um, this is a complex subject, but let me quickly mention it. See. What happens is that individual is there, people have many different aspects to them. So, their philosophy is often only one aspect. Maybe they have a cultural aspect. Mm. Maybe they have a national aspect. Maybe they have a humanitarian aspect. Maybe they have a familial or hereditary aspect. Maybe they have a artistic aspect, artistic cultural aspect. So like that, people can have many different facets to them. Of course, somebody can say something in a political aspect to it. So what I mean by this is that somebody may connect with a spiritual path or a spiritual organization for various reasons. So somebody means that the, the, the organization they are connected with is impersonalism. But you know, for them the fact that it is impersonalist is only a minor fact. They may not even know what is impersonalist. And they have gone there not because they like impersonalism at the cost of personalism. May they go, they go and maybe, you know, because in their school they read about a particular leader who went to America and gave a speech. They were very impressive. I want to know more about this. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's more like a nationalistic pride that has taken them there, rather than a philosophical interest. Or sometimes some people, you know, they, especially in America, this is happening more and more, Indian parents, they want to make sure, see, one thing about Indians is that Indians are very serious about parenting responsibilities. So, Indians when they go to America, initially they may just want to enjoy. But once they get married and have children, they want to make sure that their children are protected. They don't get uh, into uh, many of the unhealthy habits there. So, they want to pass on the culture. So, they start looking. Okay, where is the organization which offers to train something, offer some teaching to our children? And so they may join an organization, now uh, one Maya the organization is, has, is the biggest children outreach. And people go to their organization, not because they are attracted to philosophy, but they think our children should know some Rama and some Mahabharata. So they are going there more for the cultural thing. Hmm? Somebody may go there because, okay, I want uh, artistic and cultural similar, but cultural is just some general knowledge of stories. Uh, I know one from Australia, one girl, her whole family, she's a brilliant Bharatanatyam dancer. And their whole, they learned that Bharatanatyam through one impersonalist organization. Because then they, they, they had teachers. Then afterwards, she met a very, I mean, their parents met a very, oh no, not actually parents. This girl only, she somehow met a devotee in her age group. Okay? And then she became attracted. She said that, I went there, 
I would almost every week three times I would go to that particular organization, but it's only for Bharatanatyam. I never heard of philosophy. I didn't even know what the philosophy was. And she said, when I came to this devotee, this Mataji, she heard the philosophy. Hey, this is so impressive. And then she came to know that that Bhagavad philosophy is my own philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> so. Rather than simply think that okay, this person is going to Maya the organization and I have to I have to counter their Maya. Rather we need to see, okay, what is it that is drawing this person there? Mm-hmm. Sometimes it could be his family history. Even our family is this is our pull the earth, or this is our this is what our family we are worshipping. So we can try to show them how whatever they are getting over there. Now that they can get in the bhakti tradition also, in Krishna consciousness also. They can get that and they can get more. So rather than challenging their mayavad, we can focus on trying to fulfill their need in a similar or better way. And then the philosophy will be taken care of. Sometimes some people have gone for philosophical reasons. And at that time, the philosophical discussions may have to be quite animated. And sometimes we, we may not be equipped for that. We may need to need some senior devotees are more adept in the philosophy to explain. But rather than simply labeling the person the mayavadi, you know, see, one of the things is Bhakti philosophy says Sarva Padhi Vinir Mukta that give up all labels. But we have labels for everyone. You know, we fix a label. This is a Mayavad, this is a demigod of Shiva, this is this, this is this, this is that. And first of all, people are souls and they are parts of Krishna. Our labels should not blind us to the reality of who they are. So try to see. Basically, when you are trying to do outreach, don't focus on refuting their philosophy. Whatever philosophy might be. It is more important is addressing their need. That is fulfilled by that path, organization, whatever it is. And then if we can fulfill that need, then people will be quite open to bhakti. Okay? Thank you. One last question. Yes, please. You can bring questions here. Yeah. Uh, so, Krishna what is what does it mean to be detached and engaged? <coughs> what type of engagement one should have? Does it mean that one can have one is de- uh, detached and engaged engaged in sinful activities? For example, like Vishma and Drona, they are uh, on the side of Adharma. They are they are not attached to the, they are detached, but they are also engaged. Uh, they are for just they are they are just falling out of their duty. So okay, so good question. If they are detached, can they be engaged in sinful activities? See, in the case of Drona and uh, Bhishma, things are not that simple. It is for us in retrospect, it's very clear. Mm. That Dhamma was a terrible person. But then Bhishma was thinking how best he had taken a vow that he would always be there for the ruler of the Purans. He never thought that a ruler of the Purans would be somebody like Drona. So it was not simply for Bhishma and Drona. I'll focus on Bhishma, Drona we can discuss separately. Bhishma, it was like again the Dharma of Virtue. Virtue means who is right versus the dharma of vow. That I have taken a vow. I have taken a vow. So which dharma is more important? Is it sticking to the side of virtue is more important or is it honoring my vow that is more important? So it was a dharma sammoha. So it was a mis- it's certainly a mistake in judgment. But we can't really call it sinful in a very simplistic sense. So, can we be engaged? Now, going back to the broader principle, uh, when we say we can be detached and engaged, ideally speaking, it should be engaged in work that is dharmic. So, if somebody is engaging, now somebody is engaging in uh, a dharmic work, then it is problematic. It is now. I, I can't. We can't really even say that Bhishma and Dona were detached. In what sense were they detached? This this whole principle of karma yoga and karma kand, I don't think we can ap- apply that to them. Because they, they, we cannot say that they are detached 
of course we can say they are great souls so in that sense all great souls are detached you are not to say things like that but they had their attachments for Bhishma it was attachment to the wow attachment to the for Drona it was attachment to the kingdom and the, to the privileges that the Guru Kingdom had provided him yeah, and it was an understandable thing he was a completely poverty stricken person and they had built a, a whole group for him and that's how he had become a world famous teacher so for him to go against that was not so easy it's, it's a complex situation so but, but in general the attack that engagement should be responsible engagement. Okay. Yes, last question. Hare Krishna. Uh, my question is like uh, you have talked about sacrifice. The sacrifice can be of two types. Like first is like selfless, and second is like selfish. So I would say two types. There are two levels. <coughs> two levels. It means you know it's more like. I am sacrificing because I will get this, this, this right. So like uh, we, uh, if we give something uh, to some other people, so what, what should be the like, uh, initially our mindset is of like selfish kind of thing. Whether it should be like fame, name or something. Uh, so how, like what is the mindset when we are doing seva or doing, uh, doing a sacrifice? So what should be the mindset? See, at one level, Sacrifice for any motive is good. Hmm? If sac some, suppose sacrifice is called charity, somebody does charity, or somebody does save, or whatever it is. Now, at a basic level, you could say the most negative motive would be simply fame. Now, the fame mm, can, if you want to go very negative, you can say at the most negative level, it is fame to hide vice. That means somebody is like a very corrupt person. Somebody is almost like a criminal. But then they build a victim. And then Krishna says these are the demoniac people, Yajante Nama Yagya is there. They don't do Yagya of Nam, they do Yagya for Nam. <laughs> <laughs> so they are all demoniac, but then they will just give big charity and build something to so just uh, again, it's like a facade they are creating of, a deception of piety. That's not good. Fame to hide advice. Now somebody may not have vice, but he just want fame. Hmm? But then after that, they will think more of service. And actually I want to give you charity, not so much that I want to become famous, but I want to help others. Now there will be service to others. Now beyond that, it is Krishna's pleasure. For Krishna's pleasure I do this, and if I get fame, I'll accept it. But I won't be seeking fame. So there are increasingly uh, higher motives than possible. Okay. So thank you. Yeah. Like uh, when we uh, when we sacrifice or do some charity, we also get like pleasures. We feel happiness. So see, see it is not that uh, Krishna wants our unhappiness as a test of our purity. That's it. <laughs> so, so, so there are two different things you know, that. Mm. when there is love mm. now one may seek love for pleasure as a product the main product you know like it is that I love you because I enjoy being with you then mm. you say if I stop enjoying being with you I will not stop loving you it's possible but so, the, so in one sense here the intent is sorry, here the intention for the love is simply because I get pleasure but it's also possible that one may get pleasure as not a product but as a byproduct I just want to love you and that I enjoy loving you that's a by by byproduct See, if this is actually a serious relationship when somebody is in a serious relationship, it's not always enjoyable, it's not always happiness. Isn't it? Say, if a husband and wife, they are committed to raising their children. Now, when they are coming together and discussing their plans for the future of the child, 
it, it will not be enjoyable. The mother may have a particular vision, the father may have a particular vision. So now, when pleasure is a byproduct, that means that they are there because they care for each other. And then sometimes people who love each other very much, people who are very committed to each other, in that relationship there can be differences. There can be a real relationship, a real loving relationship has an array of emotions. There can be anxiety. Mm -hmm. There can be tension. So when we are when we are practicing bhakti, initially we say chant Hare Krishna or you feel peaceful, your mind will not agitated. But then if you become a serious devotee, sometimes you find the responsibility that you have in bhakti and agitate your mind. But then what happens? Of course, we don't want to be too agitated. But we understand that when we take responsibility for Krishna, then that responsibility shows our seriousness in our relationship. We become purified. So if you are bhakti, initially we seek it because we want a peaceful mind. And that's good, we get a peaceful mind. But bhakti is about not just a peaceful mind, but a purposeful mind. That my purpose is to serve Krishna. And sometimes this may be, this may come at the purposeful mind may come at the cost of peace. But then there is certain amount of deeper fulfillment. Say when we take up the responsibility of organizing some program, organizing some event, there's anxiety. But then at the end of it, when we have done that, and things went off reasonably well, there's fulfillment in mind. This is what Krishna. So, we, so, what applies to peace can also apply to pleasure. We want pleasure, of course. But a devotee is not simply seeking pleasure. So it's like pleasure is the byproduct of the relationship with Krishna. Pleasure is not the intent for the relationship. Initially, it might be. But eventually, pleasure just comes as a byproduct. The gopi is, you know, they, when Radharani is cooking for Krishna, she is cooking on 50 stores simultaneously. She wants to make 50 items for Krishna. And now, cooking on 50, years, 50 items simultaneously, there's certainly some anxiety, isn't it? But, there is anxiety, but when she offers all that food to Krishna, Krishna is pleased. There's great joy over there. Okay. So thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki, Prabhupad ki, Gaur Bhakta Nanda ki, Gaur Bhakta Nanda ki, Gaur Bhakta Nanda ki, Gaur Bhakta Nanda ki,